of why we actually wanted to like uh, how we came to create this project is because we have both been involved with other um, SILNET projects. SILNET is like short form for Southeast uh, Southeast Asia Service Leadership Network, mm -hmm. and we both were like um, past participants of other projects in Indonesia, and she was also um, a past participant of like a youth leadership um, summit. So we kept on doing work which is related to other countries in Southeast Asia, and we came together and thought of what are the things that we can do for Brunei because we kept on volunteering for other countries, right? Mm -hmm. And at that time, we, we both were actually um, in Korea. We both are student, were students in Korea. So when you say you were volunteering, it was in Korea, which you mean? No. Uh, no. We, mm -hmm. Okay, in different... Like we, some... some mm -hmm, you can go. Uh, we actually did... Um, we when we joined the project it was in indonesia and kalimantan it's quite neighbor, it's neighboring a neighboring um state of indonesia that's below brunei so we actually did a project there and then after coming back from the project we kind of realized that there's nothing much being done in brunei mm -hmm. but there's a lot of things that we can actually cover so that's how we kind of get together and discuss about what we can do in Brunei. So when yeah. you say uh, yeah. nothing much being done, it's in terms of the education or in terms of uh, what exactly we're looking for and what was missing in the uh, Brunei context? So what was missing in the Brunei context is, of course, there are some local, small local NGOs doing work. Mm -hmm. But then in Brunei, when they say... Um, like volunteering or charity is usually one-off charities. Mm -hmm. So usually this organization, they organize um, like one event where people donate stuff and then this stuff, are, uh, this stuff are being given out to people who need them, see? So we thought that it's not really a sustainable way. Of course, we, we do know that there are like one or two or three um, organizations that are trying to do a little bit more sustainable way of building and developing their beneficiaries but there's not a lot of that in Brunei yet as much as in other Southeast Asian countries. So you mean so, that there are uh, humanitarian organizations giving relief and aid set, like giving things for free but then there is no uh, systemic change or people who are really uh, doing some uh, transforming work right? Yes. Mm. Yep. Okay. Yeah so um, so when we both actually came together and sat down and we were like listing down what are, what are the things that um, Brunei people still have not really touched on. So we were listing things like environment, um, health, mental health issues, poverty. Poverty mm, is not as serious as in other countries, but we do have NGOs dealing with that. But then there was something that... Um, the country is actually focusing on right now and the country is actually like um how do you say emphasizing on this issue and yet there is not a lot of organizations doing um, programs that helps to alleviate it which is um unemployment okay so okay. which huh. is why we came to create this project project brunei youth rights yeah, which was also very surprising for me uh, as a, an outsider understanding Brunei. So because I had this assumption that Brunei is uh, having a very av high average uh, annual income and like the having good reserves of oil and so on. Right? That was like a general stereotype which I had. But you were also mentioning about the unemployment crisis which is also happening in Brunei, right? So yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if I think if you've been... Um, following up with the recent news, you would also know that there is a recent oil price crash to oh. like last week, I think. Yeah. It has yeah. reduced severely to like thirty thirty dollar per barrel or like twenty dollars per barrel. Mm -hmm. And this is like the second one I think that will severely affect affect Brunei. The first one was in two thousand fourteen or was it two thousand sixteen? Yeah, around two thousand fourteen. 
Yeah, and it actually created such a big impact on our economy because it's fully, it's, I think it's more than 70% um, based on the oil and gas industry. So because of that oil crash, um, the national budget were severely reduced. Um, of course, you would expect that to happen. But I think what follows it is the lack of industry to, mm -hmm. and um, the lack of budget to create more industries and to create more employments. Mm -hmm. So there has Brunei is actually number one in Southeast Asia mm -hmm. for unemployment. It's at nine oh. percent right now. Yeah, I think more than nine percent <laughs> at the moment. Nine point Almost 10, yeah. nine point eight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, a lot of these uh, oil dependent companies, right? And these are like large enterprises and it's like, it really has an effect if uh, the oil prices are uh, having an effect on the economy as well, right? And if, uh, what about the small and medium enterprises, uh, which are not so much in comparison, right? So that's the reason why uh, if there is some issue with the oil, it really has an effect on the economy. So we, in recent years, after the 2014 oil um, crash, the government has been emphasizing a lot on entrepreneurship and creating businesses, and they are focusing so much on it. On it, we do have small businesses. Like it's it's how do you say it's sprouting, mm -hmm. um, like sporadically, I guess, in Brunei, mm -hmm. but it's still small and medium enterprises, mm -hmm. and it's still not that enough to create a lot of jobs for the, the, the people um, like considering the qualifications that they have currently yeah and most of this uh, I would say most of these um, enterprises that are coming up most of um, the founders and uh, um, bosses they are all mostly educated some are in, even some that are not educated, they still can't find a job, even in Brunei. Mm. Yeah, even low paying ones, um, I would say it's hard for them too to find one. So even in uh, getting into these oil companies is difficult for the youth? Uh, when you uh, say it's, youth. it's not that it's difficult to get into the oil companies, it's just that a lot of the population is having qualifications not related to oil and industry too. Mm -hmm. Like they, they have other qualifications that is better matched in other industries, but cannot find a proper job because there's no opening in other industries. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Also, I would like to add to that, even if there's opening in other industries, the openings are usually maybe one vacancy or just two mm -hmm. vacancy. Yeah, so it's not enough to actually accommodate to such a big amount of graduates. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I would say like my field, there's a, a lot of graduates each year, mm -hmm. but then the vacancy is only one or two oh. for maybe a few months or even mm -hmm. for each year. So I would say it's the industry that's not... Mm -hmm. um, developing itself enough to actually accommodate such a huge amount of mm -hmm. um, people that are actually graduating from college. So Chimi is an unemployed. <laughs> yes, I'm one, one of the examples. Yeah. <laughs> she, she graduated last year, by the way. Last year, when yeah. was it? February? Uh, yeah, February. End of February. And so she's the... not... Yeah. How is the job job search like? Uh, I mean, you're going through this process, right? So, what is your experience of after your graduation? Um, well, for me, for my field in particular, and my job, uh, my post, it's quite hard because um, usually we heard in among the locals, we heard that there's no budget to actually develop to. Um, to hire enough people, but they are still wanting to hire people. So that's kind of a bit of a contradiction there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's where we see that the industry is not as developed enough to actually accommodate to such a huge amount of graduates mm -hmm. each year. Yeah. 
So and I think as, yeah, sorry, you were saying something. I think more than that, um, Brunei retirement age is quite high. High, right? yes. If I'm not mistaken, it's sixty. Right now, it's sixty. Back then, it's yes. still fifty-five. Okay. Yeah, it you has increased to sixty. Get a slot available, right? So that someone yes, exactly. <laughs> So what I heard from like government um, positions, mm -hmm. if there's one slot, the people who take the exam are like more than 600 people for this they one. They are. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah, and these people, they're not just people who are unemployed. They are people who are temporarily employed in other um, sectors, but then they want to apply to this position because their qualification is, and skills is better matched with this position. Mm -hmm. oh, so so they are... Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah, so there, there's a lot of people who are currently working in like temporary um, jobs, which does not actually match their actual skills, but because they have to earn something. Mm. Oh, so there are people who are getting into some job because it's anyway, it's very difficult to get a job. And then if they get a better opportunity, even they apply as yes, uh, yes. the same thing. Right? Oh. And, and um, to add on that also, I do have friends who graduated from like undergraduate level, but they apply to jobs which are at diploma level oh. and they got those jobs, you know? So where do these people from diploma level diploma go? Level so they, diploma it, level job, shifts. Right? Yeah, it shifts below. It keeps on shifting down. So, so most people are getting becomes... overqualified. I mean, the jobs which are getting mm -hmm. are really not suited for their position and they just want something so that they could earn something. And, Try to move forward. Yes. yes. Yeah. That is from the industry side. Mm -hmm. We do have um like other opinions saying that this our youth are not really that equipped in like social skills or employability skills skill. or communicating yeah. skills. But I think like there's just two sides in this. The industry is also not that developed, mm -hmm. but the employers are also saying that we, they want to employ people, but the people that they like try to employ are not really up to their standards. But at the same time, we do know that our friends are actually overqualified. So there's just a lot of factors going on in this. And yeah. we, we just want to do something without actually blaming anyone, mm. you know? So our project, Things that okay, what can we as youth do um, to help with this issue? And so we thought that maybe we could help um, our peer youth develop the employability skills, and that's why the project. Okay, so Project Sealand as such was already operating in uh, Philippines, Singapore, and all other Southeast Asian countries, if I'm not wrong, right? And so, you guys, uh, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, correct me so, if I'm wrong, but yeah, let me know. Yeah, so pro this is where a lot of people get um, confused because SILNET is short for Southeast Asia Service Leadership Network, right? So it's a network of people, of youth who are from um, Southeast Asian youth who are from Southeast Asia and also other parts of the world who comes to the country to do a project. So every year, each um, people, not each people, like people who want to do a project in their country proposes a project in their country. But like, it's not um, just related to employment, it's everything. You know, this year we have um, SILNET project on mental health issue in Philippines and sexual abuse in Vietnam. But for us, we propose to SILNET that we want to do uh, in 2019, a project in Brunei um, focusing on unemployment issues. So, CLNET is not a, a one size which fits all. So, you guys take the lead from your community, stating that this might be an issue and uh, yes. I would be included in this network, but also do work which is really specific to the place where I'm working on, right? Something. Yes. Like yes. Okay, and you guys had uh, proposed this issue of unemployment and trying to see if a program could really help in uh, overcoming this aspect, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so uh, yeah, a bit more about the program mm -hmm. as such and uh, what it comprises of. So, uh, maybe. Uh, so, do you want to 
start Shime. Shime? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, so um, our program actually follows the SOLNET models of um, a SOLNET project. So we have the initial phase, for the initial phase, we have um, the first week to do the leadership programs, which we use to nurture the, our project team members and then in the second week we have the out the service week where we actually goes to we went to two beneficiaries so we split the team into two and went to um a youth institution a youth development center and then another one is a middle school in another district which um, one or two districts away from our capital district. So we kind of did that in the initial phase, but both of these um, institutions were actually targeting the same thing. It's just that because both the each, each groups are quite different, so we modify it to fit the age group that we are targeting in those two institutions mm -hmm. that we are working with okay. so that's about um a little about the initial phase of our project in july so there is uh, so the initial capacity building of the uh, say the volunteers right the ones who are uh, going to take the program for forward in schools uh, the intervention is it in schools or okay and we guys can take it forward with uh, I mean, uh, the, the stakeholders, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Which is the school. Uh, how does that work? Like the second phase after you have kind of trained the youth? Okay, so for the second phase, we, um, we put, so for the second phase, we actually have um, the original members. We still have the original local members um, in the team. So they are the ones that initiate most of the um, programs and activities for the beneficiary, one of the beneficiaries um, of our, yes. So Atika has yes. Yes. Uh, shared their screen here. So um, as you can see, we have AAC on the left. Mm -hmm. uh, this yeah. is all the schools which have intervened. Uh, I mean, yes, this are were the two schools that we um, worked with in our initial phase. So there you can see Anthony Abel College on the left, and then the Youth Development Center on the right. So we kind of split ourselves into two teams um, to go and work with them. But most of the curriculums uh, are mostly targeting soft skills, but depending on the age groups that we were working with, as I mentioned just now. So after that initial phase, we have the second phase where most of the original local members from the, this project phase actually went to the school it, on the left to work with them even more. We also recruited a few uh, new members from our local university. Um, so they are kind of um, the mentees, as we call, of the team. So the original members are the one who will, who are mentoring these new members to nurture them further. Uh, and then we went to the first school that we worked with in the initial phase to have a follow-up activities with them. Yeah. Okay, so Shimei, uh, I mean, this is uh, a lot of things, right? And uh, maybe we can have a bit more of a deep dive because I really want to understand the nuance of why you chose certain things and how it worked out. Uh, so when you say the first phase, right? Uh, what are the age groups which you're targeting, uh, especially the children? Uh, um, so for the school, um, we targeted age around grade 10, is it? Grade 10, okay. Yeah, grade 9 to grade 10. Um, so, but for... Uh, and sorry? What kind of, let's say, if, if the output is to develop entrepreneurial skills, right? So uh, what are the qualities which you say is comprising of entrepreneurship and how do you really bring it in the form of a program? So what would you like to say? Yeah. So for us, we are targeting employability skills. In this case, for us, the 
the skills that we are still targeting is first and foremost um, resilience. Mm -hmm. Why we chose resilience is because we like did our research and we found that in one research um, which they did with some employers, the employ employers said that Bruneian youth lack resilience. Um, they, they, I don't know how to say this in in English. Is it it's like they, similar to how you can get back even if there is a setback. It's like whenever there is some difficulty, they still can get up and they still stay in the job mm -hmm. because I think some of the employers experience whereby um, people, some of these youth, whenever they have, whenever they are being scolded or whenever they um, suffer things which are unfavorable for them, they just quit. So that's why they say some Bruneian youth are not resilient enough. So we that's the first um, skill that we want to uh, convey. The second one is soft skills. That includes whatever the students actually would like to learn. But of course, it also includes things like communication, interview, things that are needed for interview skills because I we heard that um, Brun did it. Oh, yeah. so, uh, no, I mm -hmm. wanted the, the, the screen to be a bit bigger so that we could see. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so um so soft skills include communication skills problem solving skills um all the soft skills that is needed for a person to be able to successfully work or find work um find a decent job in the industry the third one is being innovative that currently being innovative we envision it as um, Bruneians being able to think of creating creative stuff um, and but that what that we will get to that because we'll yeah. I think our project have not really been um, deep like diving so much into that mm. and finally we think that all these skills is employable skills so that's why um, our project name is Project Youth RISE as in R-I-S-E uh, Resilience uh, communication, in and, uh, resilience, innovative, innovative. Uh, skillful, and employable. Okay. Yeah. So you rise, right? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So in the beginning, in the beginning, right? Um, during our kickoff phase, which is July two thousand nineteen, we did um sort of uh like a pre survey, pre product survey. We asked them what. What, how to understand decent employment, how to understand about experience, work experience and education, and what are the skills that they think is important for an uh, being employed. And from that survey, we work online for like more than three months working on a curriculum that um, actually try to convey those, um, deliver those skill sets. But once we go on ground, we find that these students are actually different than how we imagined, right? So, because we've always been working online. So once we went on ground, these people who have been working online did the first day and the reaction was not something that we expected. Uh, and so, what, this, uh, mm -hmm. just interrupt. so when you say working online and then coming back, what do you mean? Was there like a pre uh, training program which was happening online? No. So, mm -hmm, you can. Do you want to go? Uh, so we actually did uh, um, the planning, the curricular, uh, all the planning, all the curricular planning and such online with the international members because we also recruited international members, not just um, members from Brunei itself. So there, from there, we actually work with them online throughout um the whole way until everyone comes on ground together yeah it would also be a nice way to understand from their country how they uh, intervened right so that yes. was probably the um, thinking uh, yeah. involving other countries right? okay. mm -hmm. yeah. and, and then? so what so what happened was then when we came on ground most of the curriculum that we planned for the three months was like majorly change every night before the actual day because they found out that okay the first day the reaction wasn't 
didn't go so well or they didn't understand English well, even if they speak Malay, the students didn't understand Malay well too and things like that. So they had to fix and be flexible with the curriculum. So what every after the activity, we went back to the youth hostel and everybody like started brainstorming again and restructuring everything like the night before. The uh, most commonly spoken language, is it the medium of instruction in schools? Mm, the medium of instruction in schools is English, English okay. but in the schools that we are doing, um, this school is like it has a lot of diversity, people with, from different ethnic families. So they don't actually even speak English. They don't actually even speak Malay, which is the formal language of Brunei. Sometimes they speak their ethnic language okay. so that's when we found out that they don't some of them don't even understand a malay word and so we tried using body language or <laughs> and things like that but it doesn't work out right yeah not the same yes yeah, yeah it, it didn't work out the same so but that was fun because it was quite fun seeing our mentors and mentees actually panicking <laughs> and they were panicking and then they were changing everything based on what they see on the ground. See? So they know that um, what we realized is they, from this experience, I think they learned that volunteering or charity work, it's not like a one size, um, like one, one size fits all kind of uh, project work. So now, up until now, they kind of bring that mindset that they have to develop and design a curriculum based on their beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. So when you are designing a curriculum and let's say you have these qualities of uh, resilience and mm -hmm. right? so I want to know more of your thought process to uh, design, let's say the activities involved in the classrooms, say, for example, even take resilience for the, for this. Mm -hmm. How did you really go about uh, choosing activities? And if you have, can you give a bit of an example as such as to how you have an activity for resilience? Or something? Mm -hmm. So maybe I think the one with the ball play to me. Yeah. Um, right? So yeah, I think the yeah the one with the. Um. Hold on. Let me share you yeah. like a document. Jimmy, I'm opening a document on the hmm. one that we're supposed to do with Yaya Sana. Yeah. Can. Yeah. Go ahead. How do I share this? So hold on. Yeah. So, so this is how we do our um like curriculums. So we have a set of outreach team. Mm -hmm. Let me there there was one activity which I actually saw. Um, was it the one that you mentioned so, this one rice for the belia rice so belia. yeah so right belia means youth so so this activity is like so when we um design our activities like they say we have our pre-survey sent to the beneficiaries and from those beneficiary like the pre-survey answers we try to understand their level of literacy and their understanding of what resilience is, of what decent employment is. We try to understand their perspective. And we also try to understand um, how, what kind of activities will keep them engaged. For example, some schools are academic oriented, so they might be more interested in activities which are, which has some elements of academic, like things like debate and stuff like that but some schools are like um skills um skills based so they might be more engaged in things which are hands-on right like things which are more fun things which are like running outside and doing activity outside mm -hmm. so we try to understand all of those and then we took that pre um survey results and draft like um, an activity for example like this Every time we draft an activity, we always have it's like, like a session plan, right? Of how mm -hmm. you're going to conduct it. Okay. 
So we always have like, what are the skills that we are targeting? What are the materials? And how do we set about the mood? And for us, mood setting is important because this is like things like soft skills, right? Things that are actually being um, like born from within a person. It's something that we cannot force on them. So these are like an example of the activities. Here we try to target things on resilience and teamwork because um, say like in this activity, um, they are asked to write a goal on a piece of um, post-it notes. Post notes. So they write their goals, like the things that they really want, and then they stick it behind them, like we quite further away and then they step on like a small circle together and I'm, I'm not sure in this one but in the one in the activity that i have done we are not allowed to say anything at all we are not allowed to communicate by mouth we are only allowed to like i don't know say things like by body it. language yes. and so they are in this small circle and they are asked to, um, we are asked to like take the post-it notes, grab your goals um, without actually falling away from this small rope. So the people are supposed to help you get it in whatever way, whether they pull your legs or your body or whatever it is, as long as this one, as long as everybody gets their goals. So in this activity, the, the, the people will fail over and over again. And they will get frustrated over and over again. Over, yeah. Right? Yeah. And the thing is, they cannot say anything, you see. They cannot communicate, they cannot speak anything. And they will have to keep doing it and doing it until um, they have reached their goals. Everybody has reached their goals. So after that, um, our activities always have an element of reflection. So every and this is where ends in reflection? Kind yes. Of? Most... Yeah, almost every session ends in reflection, mm -hmm. except for um, sessions like bonding or energizer. How long so, are these sessions uh, when you are conducting in schools? How long? How long are, yeah. At the what? Sorry, can you repeat? Uh, how long do these sessions last? I mean, I'm just trying to understand. It's like a one hour, two hour session? Um, it depends on mm -hmm. the activities itself, mm -hmm. but we usually opt for um, one whole, whole day, day or mm -hmm. half a day, depending on the school times and depending mm -hmm. on whether they are um, having school or are having, um, or if it's after exam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and this one was. In... Though, uh, how do they come for the whole day? I mean, are they from college or do they uh, opt out of what they're doing as work and come to work in the schools? So how do you work with the volunteers who are involving on the whole day with the children? So, so in the kickoff project, it was the volunteers, like the mentors and the mentees, they are on semester break. Okay. So they don't have schools anyway. Mm -hmm. And so when we did um, our activities with the beneficiary, it's either we do it in the afternoon or the schools actually um, give us permission to do it like an entire day, like special day for us. Or maybe we were doing it during like Saturday, Friday, and Sundays oh. so because Friday and Sundays are holiday. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what were your experiences though with being an educator and involving in these activities? So, what were the key learnings for both of you? It's. Um, I think we learn more from the students themselves. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key learning is because sometimes when we draft activities, we draft it according to our, what we expect them to be. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we underestimate the students and we try to make it really easy for them. But then whenever we come to the reflections, sometimes the students are even more um, deep, like they think deep, deeper than we expected them to be. And so I think that's quite kind of like refreshing for us. And like, yeah. 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 Hmm. Also, um, we actually le learn probably not to assume things mm -hmm. as well. Because um, even though the pre-survey gave us an insight about 
a little insight about the students. But um, there's more to the pre-survey than we can actually get. Mm -hmm. So um, right now we're also think we're actually thinking to go on ground to uh, you know observe the students, um, just to indirectly observe them so that they are not aware that we're there and then we can actually um, observe them even more efficiently. Mm. Yeah. So you're saying if as a form of observation you might be able to get more insights from what they really like or dislike right and maybe reflection is like you're asking them directly like what you like and so on maybe observation might also be an uh, interesting way to understand what they really really uh, like right yeah. I think this experience has also like developed us greatly in terms of facilitating a reflection because um, there's a, a major difference between just teaching a person, educating them or educating them and trying to bring out like self-reflection within them. That's something that is so different, like difficult to do. Yeah. I mean, teaching them, it's just like giving instructions um, during the procedure. It's so easy to do, but whenever we come to the reflection section, we are, sometimes we find ourselves a little bit like tired too, because we are trying to process everything. We are trying to do active listening at the same time as trying to compile and like um, compile whatever they say on the spot and trying to keep the conversation going. It's still a learning process for most of us, but I think the more we do it, I think the more we can improve on it. So that's, I think that's why our um, like volunteers keep on coming back to this project. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, they might be also really tired with all the physical activity and so on, right? They might also be yeah. doing that all yeah. doing what you <laughs> Yeah. And, and Bruneians are actually not really um, well thought, not well taught, how do you say, not really well familiar with self-reflection. We yeah. never do it at all in any of our classes or education system yeah. or even like in daily life like mm -hmm. so what have we studied today we're like oh we studied only this and this but we never actually went deeper mm -hmm. so it's it's quite a challenge to do it in a, um in a community that is not really not yet um familiar with mm -hmm. such kind of self-reflection but are there other programs which happen in the schools as well there are like things like CCA, CCA is like, what do you say, co-curricular activities, co yeah. mm -hmm. uh, things like extracurricular activities, co-curricular activities, um, co-curricular activities are things which are academic, things like that is related to, that is uh, actually related to their schools, for example, like um, doing competitions and stuff. Um, Extracurricular activities are things like police cadets, um, mm. things like scouts, things like those kind of things. Yeah, but they, yeah. yeah. But I was like I in say, terms of uh, organizations, like the like how Project Sealnet is being conducted, like with your Project Rise, right? Like, are there other organizations which are also doing maybe not similar, but roughly doing an intervention in these schools as well? There are. Okay. There are. Mm -hmm. There are, um, for example, JA, Junior Achievement. I think you've met, we've met one from during the Michigan one too, okay. the one from Mexico. Mm -hmm. We have a Junior Achievement Brunei too, and they go to schools, to schools to teach about financial literacy and entrepreneurship skills. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, Perspective on Sunwood. The Global Shapers talks about employability skills too, similar to us, but they're a bit more on to like giving talks and teaching how to write um, CVs, things like that. Okay. I can see, I think in a way, all of you are really fitting in and trying to address this whole <laughs> issue, right? And it's, yeah. it's the more the people in this, uh, let's say the domain, the better it would be for the Brunei youth as well, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we're like pieces of puzzles, like yeah. um, Junior Achievement is doing entrepreneurship, <laughs> Global yeah. like Shapers is doing like all the um, interview, and then we're doing like soft skills. Yeah. <laughs> we're actually, we actually work with one of them, Global Shapers, mm -hmm. um, back in our initial phase. 
So we're kind of wor like working with um, different organizations that could help us achieve some of the soft skills that we wanted to target as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, as they all say, we're kind of in this together <laughs> to help improve the community in Brunei. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it could also be that there could be more potential for collaboration as well, right? With yep. Because you guys mm -hmm. are like uh, trying to make uh, a lot of puzzle pieces fit together so it's really interesting yeah. to see that yeah yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so um i was just wondering so yeah what next right like so let's say the program is happening and uh, we get volunteers to conduct this program as well so i think it does go in phases right if if i'm not wrong so what are the next phases involved in this project yes um <laughs> yeah so um, the in the kickoff phase, we have people from Southeast Asia coming right for two weeks. So after that, after they go back home, now we're left with local um, volunteers only. So our local volunteers, who were our mentors, and some of them are mentees in the project in July 2019, they now become like the leader of the sustainability of like phase one and phase two. And before this, they were just coming into the project being trained. Now they are the one who is leading the project and training other people. So you mean Things the mentees we, become mentors in a way and yes. train other people, right? Yeah. So in a way, like the, the job that both me and Chime did since 2018 to the kickoff phase, we are now very chill <laughs> because we have other people who are actually doing our job now. They are starting from the beginning and they are um, dealing with new beneficiaries. Now we, we potentially have four beneficiaries mm -hmm. and our mentees in last year are the ones who actually approach the schools. Uh, they do from ground zero. They talk with the teachers, they talk, um, they do the pre-survey, they draft every single thing. And both of us are now the advisors mm -hmm. because we want them to actually experience through that mm -hmm. whole thing and learn through the Can process. Can we actually see a bit of a, some pictures if, if, if there is something to share? I just want to... There are. Uh, yeah, yeah. it would be nice to see what's happening. Yeah. It's all in the um, website that we're going to show you. Yeah, it's all in the website. Yeah. Like, um, I'll go to the home. Oh, wait, I haven't just shared it. <laughs> so the media team actually did a good job revamping the website. <laughs> yeah. so, for, so for example, this one, right? These are our, not our original members. These mm -hmm. are training for the new members. Like for example, him, he, um, the, the people in this picture, the two people, they are actually... Um, the mentees and a uh, and mentor. mentor, but now they are the one training this new sets of um, like mentees. I think in a way uh, it's quite nice that by involving them in your program, they're also getting the leadership skills which you guys yes. want yes. to focus. And, on, right, so that's quite nice. Yeah. And then after that, they are the one. This let me go to the new one. This is our new beneficiary. This is a oh, wait. <laughs> It goes to okay. our <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that, yeah. before that. This is our new beneficiary. The the one in the middle, she's our she used to be our mentee, but she is the one leading the outreach team this time. And um this whole leading. Youth, yeah, she leads this time and um it's quite amazing to see how they grow, like because we've seen them grow for like the whole year. Mm -hmm. Um so they sort of did like uh, an activity with a new school and this new school is actually quite a new set of target group which is primary school so we have never actually worked with primary school last year so it's oh, something was, that they have to adapt to uh so yeah so this is after one the one one program right after they go through one phase it's they are equipped yes. enough to train the younger children yes, yes this is this year <laughs> so this is a new set of beneficiaries and oh, that's really nice. and they're not just training younger students they're also training people who would be facilitators for this beneficiary okay. basically they are taking charge of their own team 
Yeah, so all you have to do is to give advice, right? And it's like yeah. everything yeah. is sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> Currently, it, I mean, for for now, we are trying to achieve, like, we are wanting it to continue for a long time. But um, I think we still have to look and take care of the project, maybe for another one year hmm. to see that it. Yeah, so I think that might be work involved in uh, getting more beneficiaries and training more youth, and also in mm-hmm. terms of the program as such, right? So you were saying about creativity as well, and so on. So. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on this as well? Sorry. Uh, what are your thoughts on the program as well? Like, how do you uh, make it better and take it forward? Uh, For right now, we actually want to um, focus a lot on like design thinking, right, Jimmy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. La- last year, I think our project and our program has always been based on design thinking, but we have never made it explicit to the mentors and the mentees and mm-hmm. also to the beneficiaries. Mm-hmm. So we started um, doing like a bit of, uh, a, like quite a bit, it's quite a big event last year. It's called the Humanists of Brunei. Humans of Brunei. I think I had seen this in your site. It, uh, yeah. yeah, I think Can we have it here too, you know? Yeah, we do, we do. Uh, we do, right? Yeah. I think it's at the last one, our footprints across Brunei. I think it's Is in it that. Is it like a grassroots uh, volunteer network? Yeah, yeah so basically it's an event that actually, uh, we how we managed to come up with this um, activity is we actually did a, a mini one back in the mm-hmm. initial phase. So we decided that it will be, actually be a good opportunity to showcase how we actually work uh, as a project of, as part of Solnet. Um, so what we actually focus here is on active volunteerism where we actually go um, and we actually go to the sites to talk with the people and get to know the situations there and then come try to come up with um, solutions that we think might be able to alleviate or help um these problems mm-hmm. yeah. so, so uh, to is there any case or uh, an example which can make this more clear for us uh, so like to add on that i guess um like like we said uh in brunei people are so used to one-off charity so we are trying to change this sort of idea from one of charity to like active participation mm-hmm. so in this activity there, there was um was part of the international volunteers day i guess mm-hmm. it was part of the whole country's international volunteers day and uh, we did like a two two days activity one in one district and the other one in the further district and so before people come into this um uh like into the humans of brunei we have like a 20 minutes session like yeah. teaching not teaching them like trying to them introducing them to the concept of design thinking like the whole design thinking chart saying that like hey design thinking it looks something that is very complicated it's used me mainly in like doing prototypes and stuff like that but hey yeah. what if we take this design thinking flow into your daily life into your like um volunteering and try to think of doing activities that is actually um, suited best for the people, like doing needs analysis, see? So we try to introduce them. Of course, it's not really a, it wasn't a long lecture kind of time. It was just a short introduction because we cannot like say, teach them in like one whole, one whole session, right? So before they go to interview people, they, they know that they should go to the people, understand and emphasize on what are the needs of the people in the community. And so when they go for the humans of Brunei, they interview people, random people around the district, around the place that we are going. So they go and they ask questions, they try to think from the person's point of view. And then after the interview session in the afternoon, we have another session of um, like sharing session, right? Mm -hmm. Sharing session and trying to come up with an activity that best suits the needs of the people that they are, they have interviewed. Mm 
Mm. So, for example, if they've interviewed like old people and they were complaining about um, their business, um, how their business are not doing well, maybe in the afternoon they can gather this information and create like a um, community, like a plan for a community project like a or process. a charity. Like yeah. a process, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm. And so we shared all those. And it was like, it was quite fun, I think, right, Jimmy? Yeah, it was. And the participants <coughs> also actually like our activities because oh, they feel it's that. very <laughs> engaging. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they, some of the participants that uh, applied for that uh, activity actually came back and applied as our for our recruitment and some of them is actually in our team right now so yeah. this is done by the outreach team right uh, yes volunteer. Yeah. the and planning is done day. by the outreach mm -hmm. this happens for a day the whole uh, yes. this happens for a day for example like this one the one that i share um th this is the second one right i think you ha this yes. this activity has quite a number a big number this one has a bigger number um so this was done in a weekend event um, in another district. Um, we, the activity also focuses on um, the same thing as the first one. It's just that um, it's more engaging for this one somehow. Yeah, I can really understand. Probably. They are going to mm -hmm. the person and asking them questions and mm -hmm. really understanding what their needs are, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I can really imagine myself and it would be pretty interesting for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are kind of like the, the idea that we try to convey to the general community because we are trying to change this thinking, mm -hmm. just one of charity to like active participation and really based on the needs mm -hmm. of the community, which is not really, I, I think Bruneian NGOs are improving in this matter, mm -hmm. but we still need the whole society, like the whole mm -hmm. volunteers to have those kind of mindset too. It's not just the organization, but mm -hmm. like volunteers too should have such yeah. kind of mindset. I mean, if they start giving things for charity <clears throat> at some point, like they might not be having any sense of ownership like for what they're getting. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Really, so it's a bit of a also, also, it serves as um, an experience for these participants to actually mm -hmm. get to know their community even better because um, as this is done um, in another district, we don't usually know about mm -hmm. things that's happening in another district. Yeah, so um, it's actually a good chance for the participants to be more exposed and be more engaging and to get to know more about what is happening around the country, not just India, um, in the main district itself. Yeah. But like on a daily basis too, we seldom go to a stranger and say, and talk to them, you know. Our society is no longer like that. Like I think our generation is not used to going up to a stranger and say, hey, how are you today? Like talking very casually. Yeah, it's no longer a culture. So it's quite a like a new experience, I guess, for them to talk to a stranger and actually trying to get to understand their life experiences. It's also very refreshing for them because um, these people that they talk with, they also offer things sometimes. They also um, <laughs> offer like, um, I think the one that we did back in, initial, in the initial phase, we have our international members playing, playing uh, with the local band that's in the market. Yeah. So they, what happened exactly? So they, they were playing at the local band and then? So I think they were just talking with them, right? It was, it was, it was yeah. So in the initial phase in July, mm -hmm. um, we have all the international members too, right? So they, they go to like the, the market and they talk with people. And not only that, they get to know about the issue of unemployment through the perspective of these people that they interviewed, but they also get to know a little bit about Bruneian culture because these people in the market, they sell things. Yeah. Like the, one of the stalls, they are selling um, traditional music, uh, like instruments, mm -hmm. uh, things that we 
I think me and Shime also have, oh. don't know how to play and we seldom listen to and yet our international members are exposed to this activity. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, it's really nice. So yeah, you were saying about humans of Brunei, but with relation to the phase three, right? Uh, yeah, but this is also pretty uh, interesting. This is part, this was actually not part of our plan in the, oh. the first phase because um, we came up with this because there was like something about the international volunteers mm -hmm. day and other people were like coming up things like okay cleaning recycling um things like sh uh, collect food stuff and donate it to other people really volunteer stuff mm -hmm. so that's how we came up with the idea like okay let's include this activity and this activity was like thought of in like less than uh, I, I think it really, was very yeah. last minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we got the funding last minute too, I think, because we need the funding yeah. for the refreshments and the buses to bring people. Yeah, it was, I think, after the first event, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. <clears throat> you have governmental so, support in terms of grants and funding sources? How does that work to really execute what you have in mind? Um, so for in this case, in terms of this human of Brunei activity, um, the main organizer is the Ministry of um, Culture, Youth and Sports and the, the student councils of the local university. So they are the ones that are the main organizers and they actually provided, I think, a num uh, an amount of funds to each um, organizations that applied for and that applied for this um, international volunteering day. So, in terms of that, it's more of the funds are more coming from the thing you could say student council, is it? Correct, so, if I'm wrong. Yeah. So. I think we are trying to keep ourselves afloat for now um, because most of our fundings come from um, like crowdfunding and donations. But right now we are partnering up with the university club, which is the University Volunteering and Charity Club. And they actually have um, funding for their activities. Mm -hmm. So most of our activities don't really need that much that like high amount of funding except when we had our international members yeah. like when we had our international members that one we needed um funding for accommodation and food so for funding for accommodation we got like partial sponsorship from the ministry of um uh, culture youth and sports but now um since we are doing things locally the only uh like expenses that we need we have is on maybe certain small stuff for our um, outreach activities or um, transport and things like that so things like that could be covered still by our current funding uh, so yeah i mean shimei and atika so i was just wondering uh, in terms of i think i really like the way that it's structured and trying to bring in a lot of volunteers but i was also seeing how it's the roadmap is right like what is the overall vision and how the next year or the year ahead will be right now. So um, we understand that things like soft skills and employability skills, it's something that has to come from within, like things like resilience too and motivation. So we understand that we cannot actually do this in just like one year or two years. We hope that we can continue um, like more than two years with this project. And we know that our current volunteers, like mentees and mentors, they are students in university. Like some of them are third year, some of them are fourth year. Maybe next year they, they would have to graduate. So we would constantly need to recruit more people and more new facilitators. But I think in that sense, I think we are doing quite well because we are collaborating with the university club in two so whenever this university club they receive new members we would also be able to access to new um potential members and and mentors but we would also try to actually involve the students 
in our planning. So we've tried to do that since last year. We call them um, the student ambassadors. But ambassadors in this case, they are not just people who spread about SealNet, about our project to their peers, but they are also the ones who communicate with um, the facilitators, the outreach team members. They, we come together and um, they also have an experience in proposing their own, like say, activities. So uh, maybe she may, because she was on ground at that time, maybe you can explain what happened. Um, so for these student ambassadors, um, it's not, we just name them as ambassadors because they are acting as a representative um, for their peers um, and as a mediator for us. So um, not just the ethical, we don't involve them just because we want them to, um, for the sole purpose of just promoting um, our project, but it's more of um, also including them in our planning process whenever we are doing activities in their school with them and also it serves as a mediator for us to actually understand their peers more which we would be doing um, our activities with them um, during the service day with them so that's some of the functions of these ambassadors um, at the moment, we're, we're just trying to involve them more in the planning process and also the facilitation process because we feel that um, these student ambassadors that we um, picked out and recommend that were recommended by the principals herself, mm -hmm. um, we see a form of leadership potentials in them that we feel like if they are not being nurtured properly, it's kind of a waste um, to actually just let go of these potential ones. So we nurture them in a way that, um, we, that we see fit according to each person. And then we, util we not utilize, but more like we um, engage them in our facilitation activities when we go to their schools to um, to carry out these activities. So they are kind of like a mini members of our team. You could like, consider like that. Like our mentees. Yes. So it's like yeah. almost like a core team, right? So they you yeah. engage them yes. uh, even in yep. such uh, critical decisions yes. as well. So yes. what we them what we want them to understand is that like when we do this planning with them, we, we try to engage them in the discussion and like the brainstorming of what employability skills are. And how are they, as a student, like as a peer student, actually could deliver it to their friends? So we want them to be able to actually, like, have this capacity to do their own activity in their school, maybe in the future, like without our project members, mm -hmm. like having any involvements. Mm -hmm. I think if that happens, then we can truly say it is sustainable. Yeah, I think the it's truly sustainable when it's as less intervention as possible, right? Yes. So truly coming exactly. to that stage. Exactly. Also, so, yes. oh. <laughs> also um, we also wanted to serve um, our, give them our project as a platform for them to um, learn on, learn and enhance um, the potentials they have. Mm -hmm. So these students that we picked out are actually, um, some of them are actually part of the student councils of in their school. So we actually wanted to serve as a safe platform for them to learn and, you know, make mistakes and then um, grow as they go on with their studies mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. I think with, with the leadership skills, especially it, it, it will really come when there is actually a leadership role, which they are being assigned to. Right. Yes. And, and it comes, really implemented. Yeah. Yeah. and it comes back to our SILNET meaning, which is um, Southeast Asia service leadership. Right. So we are trying to deliver that service leadership mm -hmm. spirit to these students as well. Mm -hmm. So what? Uh, so what plans after this uh, for both of you? Uh, with team and then how everything is going to take shape? So uh, honestly, we were so happy this year because we have new beneficiaries. Like we have um two new two new schools, 
and we have potentially two other new schools which maybe if we if it adds up uh, if we add it up it becomes six but then we got delayed we were supposed to have two activities right now um this month we oh, we yes. were supposed to have two activities and one it's activity actually has 80 students oh. she made the Which one with one? aac aac was oh. actually, yeah <laughs> actually 80 students signed up for oh, that yeah, one yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. And then another school, which is a new school, and we were supposed to have it on the same day, I think, right? But because of coronavirus, schools are closed right now. We can't, these are not in our hands as well, right? It's... Yeah, so yeah. Um, currently we have been trying to think of about plans because we think that coronavirus is not, yes. uh, should not be the reason why our um, pause is paused. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to um, try to find other platforms to deliver um, mm -hmm. our vision. You so currently- on virtually as well? Is that what you We are trying to think yes. of virtual platforms mm -hmm. at the moment. That yeah, would be really interesting, right? Uh, I mean, think everything which you're doing physically and convert into virtual. Exactly. Uh, probably yes. like, a team, like how we are doing it now. And <laughs> People from different places to speak and, to the children. Uh, yep. And the most interesting thing is that it's going to be a challenge for our team, which will help them grow more. Because in Brunei, not every like beneficiaries, like individuals, will have internet connection. Like me and you guys will have internet connection because um, we're university students. But yeah. from the schools that we do, there are some people who are from like. Um, underprivileged families mm -hmm. they don't really have data they don't really have access to internet mm -hmm. so it will be a, quite a bit of challenge mm -hmm. for our team to try to access them but i think it's yeah, yeah. i think it's needed need the challenge yeah, i mean uh it's something is better than doing nothing right like at this point exactly. we see that corona is stopping us from doing we cannot care yeah we won't yeah. let that happen mm -hmm. <laughs> like really uh nice spirit which you guys have and it's really nice to talk to you guys uh, yeah. this i would like to conclude the the session as well uh, i'm uh, sorry to keep you long but it was it's really okay. nice for me to understand okay. your work yeah. in, in detail right so uh -huh. yeah, pretty interesting yeah and thank you thank you for inviting us too yeah. and I mean, she may, she, he is the one who we wanted to collaborate with last time, ah, I remember. I see. Yeah. Okay. But, but yeah. right now, but it's a problem right now doing a collaboration with international um, NGOs in Brunei because of coronavirus. Yeah. Yes. All international collaborations are cancelled oh. this year. So we'll try to think of yeah, how we can and, and plus, if everything arrange. is virtual, uh, I mean, <laughs> think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I would like to conclude and if it's possible to share your social media account so that uh, the audience can also see, uh, you can share. Yeah. Um, do you want us to share it on yeah, the, you the can share a screen and then probably show your yeah. accounts so that would be easy for them. Okay. I think we can. The uh, project one, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's pretty slow tonight. Mm. <laughs> it's kind of slow these days. I think <laughs> probably be with everyone in everyone the house. Everyone the internet, right? All of <laughs> yeah. them are really awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it was raining heavily too yeah. recently. So. Yeah. So this is our Facebook. You can search like Silnet Project Brunei 2019. Yeah. Um, we might change it the name soon to Project Youth yes. Rise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are currently thinking of rebranding our social media and our uh -huh. website as well. Yeah. Okay. And then we have our Instagram, which is Silnet PB nineteen two, mm -hmm. or Silnet Project Youth Rice. Youth Rice so yeah. you can look for us. Um, we will have we have our um, contact email here in the sure, Facebook. Yeah. I will yeah. probably send this in the description of the the, the podcast. So that yeah, would be sure. fine. Um, yeah. 
yeah so that's that's about it then and have a nice day i don't know what time is it now it's almost <laughs> it's 9 now, right? to 9:30 9:30 at night yeah it's around <laughs> 1 o'clock here in amsterdam so yeah it's like good. it's almost that time <laughs> but it's okay i mean it's usually the time where we actually have meeting <laughs> oh yeah we do okay yeah <laughs> okay all right shimai it's nice to know you as well and adhika i stay in touch and yeah <laughs>